as I start speaking, I, I did have a speech ready uh, when I came, thinking that members of the proposition would come up with lots of facts. They would, uh, not, unlike uh, Salmanji said to us, uh, come up with fake news, fake futures, or fake promises. So I was hoping that I would have a whole list of facts that I could come and rebut when I came here. Having listened to the first three speakers, I haven't heard a single fact yet. All I've heard is, Modi didn't do this, the BJP government didn't do this, it's all proven. Where is it proven? Because you say so? Because Google says so, and I know, Chaitanya, you use Google for your references. I warn you, that's dangerous, because you've already got a fact about me wrong. But I thank you for it. You said I'm a financial consultant with only 50 hits. Suddenly, I'm sure I'll get lots more hits for financial stuff. I have nothing to do with finance. I'm a lawyer by background. <laughs> so thank you. And now that an Oxford Union lawyer has said to me that I'm a finance person, I'm sure I'm going to get thousands of hits now. So thank you for that. Um, the reason I say that is that in all these discussions about India, it scares me. It scares me how many people believe what they read. And I say that for all of you on both sides. What is written is not always true. So what I want to talk about is what is real for me. And I'm slightly different. I have a declaration to make here. I'm not part of the Oxford elite. I'm not part of the rich Indian elite. And I have no conflict of interest here. I'm not going for political uh, positions either in India or in UK. So when I speak, I speak from a real life experience of being both an Indian and being in Britain. And I'll tell you what my experience has been. The other difference is I was born when Chaitanya, you were probably still in nappies, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I was around in India. I grew up in a place called Hyderabad, which some of you may know. Um, Hindu-Muslim riots happened well before Modi, okay? And they will happen after Modi if we do not have confidence in the Indians of that beautiful message that you said, unity in diversity. And I say that as a Modi supporter, that unity in diversity is the crux of what we do. And I hope that we agree with the 600,000 Indians that go to democratically vote for that. Because when they vote for it, they hope Yes, they do hope, and I think that's great that Modi has given us some hope. Because I tell you as an Indian that grew up in Britain, how did people used to look at me when I uh, grew up in uh, Britain? Not the way British people look at Indians now. They come to us and ask us to speak. They come to us and say India's at the same table that everybody else is at because of where India is in the last five years. It has given Indians over the world, the Indian diaspora and Indians in India, a newfound confidence. And I like that hope and a new a found a confidence in unity and diversity, not in the divisive politics that actually I've heard more from the proposition than I did from my colleagues. I applaud Nori, who despite her reservations, despite what she heard in some of the press about what he's about, has said, actually, you have to vote with the people of India. If the people of India have confidence in this, who is Oxford Union to say, no, we are, they are wrong? And it was interesting when I first came here and what people said to me when I came here. A lot of people said to me, Janavi, it's going to be a stitch up. It's a fix, what's going to happen? People will have come here with their views in mind already. Not because of uh, what they have experienced or anything like that, but because the BBC has peddled that Hindu-Muslim riots happened. Uh, some person died and suddenly 46 people that were Muslims were killed. Where was the BBC when 56 of my Sikh brothers were killed and Rajiv Gandhi and Indira Gandhi did nothing? They stopped the police from going in. Why were they not accused of being divisive amongst Hindu, Muslims and Sikhs? <laughs> It, has, it is unfortunately a realism that there is division and this is something we need to tackle with real truth, not with rhetoric and please don't divide us by just making people out to be on one side or the other because we're not. I hope for unity as much as every one of us hopefully in this room hopes for but I also want somebody that can give us hope. And let's have a look at some of these things, the statistics and everything else you, you've talked about. What is wrong with giving people a vision? He has come up with six campaigns, none of which are to do with religion, 
none of which are to do with division. Digital India, whether it's worked or not, I live in a country currently where young people do not have hope. He gave us hope in India. He gave us hope that we can, I can put you at the table with everyone else and digital, no thanks. He gave us hope and he looked, uh, and he's given us a forward looking message. Make in India, um, smart cities, start up India, Swachh Bharat. And let me talk again, I'm one of the few on this panel here that come from a generation and that is a woman. I can tell you when I was growing up in India and when we used to go to India, I wasn't, as I said, part of the rich elite or anything. We were part of the poor that grew up. My parents were fortunate enough to be professionals and therefore got out of that poverty. But a lot of my family is still there in India and I can tell you the difference now for them. They have toilets to go to across India. It may seem like a small thing here, but if you grew up in India, you will know what it meant. We used to have to travel nearly a mile away, and as a woman, it was degrading. He has given us hope that that is not going to be there for women anymore. Now, if you want to deplore that, go ahead, because he hasn't built enough. What were you doing for the last 40 years when you were around before? Not one toilet. And here's the greatness of the current... Um, uh, uh, government. Modi said, it is not me that did it. I applaud every, every government that came before me, every volunteer that came before me. It is a right of every Indian to have sanitation. I'm just doing my duty. So let's applaud people that come up with uh, thoughts like that. Um, economy. Let's have a look at the economy then as well. Um, everybody's talked uh, here and said, oh, he hasn't done what he promised on the economy. Well, in 2016 and 2000, uh, to 2017, UK India Business Council recognised that um, India surpassed the US and China for the top place for foreign direct investment as a result of making India liberalised, as a result of the policies that were in the current government. Now, you may choose to say, oh, it was just India's destiny. They were in the right place at the right time. Again, why didn't it happen before when we had 40 years to do that? Um, one of the other issues uh, that was being talked about was jobs and the poor. I say it from my personal experience, as I said to you, not from the statistics that anybody is putting out there. I look at my own family. We had, my mother had four sisters, my father had three brothers. Everything, and we were not, we were working class middle, and we are working class middle class people here in UK too. What are the opportunities that are there for us now? All of them have ended up in jobs which weren't even available to people from there. You talked about linguistics, and what was it? North, North Indian Brahmins. Well, I'm none of those. I'm not a Hindi speaker, I'm not a North Indian Brahmin, okay? And the opportunities that I and my family have got have been there because of the liberalisation, because of the movement and the hope in the last five years, I hasten to add, not before that. Finally, security and India-Pakistan. We live in a world, not just India-Pakistan, we live in a world where terrorism is truthfully there. We all need to tackle terrorism on a real debate, not with emotion. And for those of you that talk about the current war, remember what Modi did when he first came into government. His first invite was to the Pakistani government. That has never happened previously. No other prime minister did that. So where is that threat? After several encounters, after several attempts to do something, only then has the world come to what it has today. So yes, let's talk India, but let's talk India not from these perched and beautiful places in Oxford Union. Let's talk about it, talking to the real people in India who hope has been given to. Finally, I wanted to end on a nice little story that I heard when, uh, because I compare everything that's going on in India to what's going on in Britain and globally, and that's a side that we should not forget where India's position is in the globe. And I remember um, many people, when the Brexit vote happened and things were happening, people were talking about, uh, uh, there was a joke that was going around, that the whole world, all the world leaders are sitting at a poker table 
trying to decide who's the most stupid. Um, uh, and they said, England's taken an early lead with the Brexit vote, but don't worry, the US has the trump card. <laughs> I'd like to add to that. Finally, India and China also is at that table. We run a risk with China. They hide their cards, they have lots of things, and they play by their own rules. India, for years, had a Ghulam. Now we've got a Raja, a Raja who has people's hearts at minds. So let's look at the Indian people when we do a vote today, not on personalities, not on uh, divisive rhetoric. Let's do it on what the Indian people need and what the world needs, because the world needs someone that will give us hope and that will do things not for personal selfish gain, but for everybody, for the whole of society, and actually for unity and diversity. Namaste, Sat Sri Akal, and Walikum Salam. Thank <laughs> you.